One of the most eye-catching songbirds of eastern North America, the Baltimore Oriole is easily recognized. Especially adult males, which are the ones with the vibrant flame orange plumage contrasted by a solid black head and upper back. It isn't until the fall of their second year after finishing their annual molt that adult males obtain this coloration. Adult females and immature males aren't as striking, displaying a yellow-orange color on the breast, grayish on the head and back, with two bold white wing bars as opposed to the adult males who have one. An interesting thing is that over the years and after each molt, adult females become a deeper orange color, so much so that the older ones can be nearly as bright orange as the males. The difference in plumage coloration between male and female birds is known as dimorphism. The accepted reasoning for why male birds in most species tend to be brighter in color than the opposite sex is because females choose individuals with the brightest plumage. Although, younger males that aren't as colorful don't seem to have much of a problem attracting a mate either. Since it is more commonly females who sit on the nest, they need to be able to blend into their surroundings. Being brightly colored would give them away to predators. So that seems to be another reason for the difference in color. Roughly the size of a red-winged blackbird but slimmer, this delightful passerine measures 6.5 to 7.5 inches and weighs a little over an ounce. Compared with other songbirds, they are considered to be medium-sized. These beautiful birds have a sturdy body with thick necks, long legs, and sharp beaks. Orioles in North America were named after similar looking birds in the Old World due to them being brightly colored with long tails and long pointed bills. However, the two groups are not closely related. The ones here in the New World are actually in the same family as blackbirds and meadowlark, the Ecteridae family, not the Oriolidae family from the Old World. Baltimore Orioles are not birds that you'll find in deep forests. Instead, they like to hang around deciduous trees and open areas, including parks. These neat-looking birds have adapted well to suburban areas as well. Preferring to forage higher up in trees, it can be hard to spot one. Feeding does take place down lower, though, where they can be observed on the branches of trees or in and around vines and bushes searching for insects, blossoms, or fruit. The diet of these birds changes with the seasons. In summer, while breeding and feeding their young, they consume more insects, such as beetles, grasshoppers, moths, and flies. Spiders and other small invertebrates are on the menu too. Pest species such as tent caterpillars and fall webworms are in their diet as well. For this reason, they play an important role in protecting forests. In spring and fall, nectar and ripe fruits make up more of their diet. Sugary foods like this convert into fat, helping to supply energy for migration. Due to their love of ripe fruit, they can sometimes be known as a pest, unfortunately, because crops like raspberries, mulberries, cherries, and oranges can be damaged. Often, the pure liquid whistling tones of males is heard without being able to see the culprit, as they tend to sing higher up out of view. However, sometimes they perform from visible locations where their orange color can easily be seen. Singing is done to establish and defend a breeding territory. The female Baltimore Oriole also sings, but it's shorter and seems to be used to communicate to her mate. Another call, which is used by the male and female, is a chatter-like one that is given during aggressive encounters. This call alerts other Orioles nearby and can attract them to help get rid of the threat. When it comes to territory, these birds don't defend a large feeding area. Only the space near their nests are guarded. Because of this, it's possible to see several neighboring Orioles feeding close to each other. Although they may feed closely, these birds are not known to be very social, except before migration when fledglings gather in small flocks anywhere from 5 to 15 individuals. Over winter, and especially at good feeding sites, lone birds may forage in small, sometimes mixed species flocks. Even during this though, they are found singly. 
Now that spring is here, many Orioles are arriving back from the south, getting ready to breed. Migration is taxing on their body, leaving them hungry and in need of high-energy food. That is good news for backyard birders because this is a great time to attract them. There are Oriole feeders you can buy at local stores. Homemade grape jelly go into the little slots, but make sure to only provide a small amount to help prevent the risk of soiling their feathers. In the bottom, fill it with properly made sugar water to supplement their flower nectar that Baltimore Orioles gather. Another way to provide fruit is by hanging ripe orange halves from trees. You can also attract them to your garden by planting nectar-bearing flowers or fruit-bearing trees. This will keep Baltimore Orioles coming back year after year. Also, outdoor vegetable gardens attract insects, which in turn could catch the attention of these neat-looking birds. Something to consider, though, is refraining from using insecticides on your plants and trees as this kills their food source and may actually kill the birds as well. Which brings me to their population status and threat. According to Partners in Flight, the global population is estimated at 12 million, with 82% spending part of the year in the U.S., 18% breeding in Canada, and 24% wintering in or migrating through Mexico. On the Continental Concern list, they rate a 10 out of 20. One problem for Baltimore Orioles is deforestation and habitat loss in many nations. The reason for this being that they breed in North America and winter in Central or South America. Due to this, conservation of these birds requires international cooperation. Another problem is the spraying of insecticides on a wider scale, killing their food. And one other threat is during migration. Since they migrate at night, as with many other songbirds, Baltimore Orioles can become disoriented by lights or rainstorms, causing them to collide into tall buildings and radio towers. For some context, more than 100 million bird deaths occur in North America annually. Pretty sad, but there is hope with Audubon's Lights Out program. During migration months, building owners are asked to turn off excess lighting, providing the birds with a safer passage. It's a win-win, really, cutting down on unnecessary bird deaths and saving money by reducing energy consumption. It's great to see organizations, building owners, and a whole nation working together to help our avian friends have a safer travel. So I'm curious, how many of you have been seeing these awesome birds returning? And of all that I went over, what did you enjoy learning about the most? I also want to say a big thank you to all who provided videos and pictures. This video wouldn't have been possible without your help. Links to their social media or websites will be down in the description, so make sure to check them out. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.